Okay, there's comics, there's toys, there's statues, there's cards, there's shirts, there's guests, there's actors, there's artists, there's writers, there's... How much time do I have? Certainly, something that's at, that's at its very, very core, you know, is, is the fact that there are morality plays and, you know, hopefully the hero triumphs over evil. And even in, in the sake of Marvel comics, even when the hero doesn't win, there's still an overall lesson to be learned about being heroic in the face of defeat. So yeah, I mean, there's always that uplifting message with comics, and I think that, that that's part and parcel, part of the charm of comic books. I'm Brandon Peterson. Hi, this is Tim Townsend. Hi, my name is Tony Harris. This is Adam Hughes. My name is Pop Man. My name is Mike Fluke. I'm Jonathan Luna. Josh. <laughs> Cully Hamner. Todd DeZego. They call me a lot of things. I searched my brain a long time to, to come up with the name I wanted for my store. The full name actually came uh, from a Fleetwood Mac song. I twisted it up a little bit. Their song was Heroes Are Hard to Find, and I just put the R on it because we obviously had plenty of them. Uh, they weren't hard to find here. I see you're a fan of the series. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason I was asking about the originals is I'm a, a doctor as well. And oh, so, really? Yeah, so issue two has a lot of medical scenes. Oh, I referenced that like crazy. I tried to make sure, and, and then he also used a lot of medical uh, dialogue in that series, too. Yeah. The thing I love about it is, is I can actually interact with all the other artists. And it's not a big deal. I don't, you don't feel like you, it's not impossible to approach people. To me, it's my favorite. It's the artist convention. I see a poster there for Nightcrawler, the movie. Is this a story you're trying to develop or something no, you just it was, played around it with? it was just or? a fun thing. That's a great poster. It's, it's based on the, uh, the mini-series. You know, what, what we, we've got the, the Bamps there, and there's one Boggy back in there somewhere. And, but uh, uh, it, it's purely a fun spoof thing. And I was hoping you would do a beast sketch. Yeah. A little beast? I'd always liked comics, and I, I grew up drawing all the time. I think it's a great job. I, you get to work at home. You get to set your own hours. You get to you get to draw incredibly fun things and uh, make fantasies happen. Well, you know, these are a little more cat looking, but I I've sort of tried to tinker with them a little bit in our own way. Uh, the guys before were making them very cat like, like he's turning into a cat, and I, I kind of like the idea that. He doesn't know what he's turning into. Yeah. I don't like that he knows that direction. I, I, I like the idea that maybe in the back of his mind he's afraid he's turning into just some monster, yeah. you know, something indescribable. It goes a long way to meet fans and, and uh, find out that so many people appreciate what you do. And there's not a whole lot of industries, there's not a whole lot of jobs in, on this planet where you get to actually have a fan besides your mother. Nice meeting you. You bet, nice meeting you. Take care. Well, I was getting roughly, I think, 60 or $65 to do a Superman cover or a Batman cover or one of these covers. Then they had an auction in San Diego of Wonder Woman. She was strapped to a bomb falling on New York City. They sold that thing at the auction for $9,000. My first convention was in 1996, and it was here. And uh, then people started praising me for my work. When I was doing it, nobody gave a damn. <laughs> I'm a brush painter that borrows from Eastern traditions of Zen art, as well as Western styles of acrylic painting and uh, oil painting. Style usually starts with an energy stroke, which is uh, a random stroke that's not uh, premeditated. And after that, uh, you, you form the image from that. Um, so it keeps it fresh, keeps it alive. David Mack introduced me to the comic book convention world where I could find publishers and other people to 
to make a living. And uh, thanks to him, I was able to understand the business of comics and, you know, going to conventions. Pretty much I'm one of the rare guys in the industry and in that I, I do my own pencils and inks. Some people do the job separately. Um, I have a cable that but uh, I also do colors as well, so I'm kind of a triple threat or a triple disgrace, depending on your opinion. Comics, you know, just the mass appeal of seeing the stuff in movies and things, it's not considered that sort of geeky, closet, you know, like, oh, it, that's not cool. And I always say, point this out to people, you know, because it's still a little bit of that stereotype. I go, what are the top movies of all time? Superheroes, fantasy, and science fiction. So if, if, if it's only like a couple hundred geeks going to all these movies, they must have a lot of money to spend. Because as far as I can see, it looks like everybody like going to Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. So I guess everybody's a little geeky at heart. The kind of stories you can tell, the kind of art you make is uh, basically limitless, you know. It's just all up to you and your mind and imagination. Telling stories and drawing pictures on paper and making books and... Um, I like that kind of... Uh, old school flavor about it. In 1986, there was a small publisher in Arizona that got the license for Disney comic books in America, I guess because nobody else wanted it. And uh, I saw that as the opportunity that I'd always wanted to, to write and draw just one Uncle Scrooge story. Donald Duck comics are the world's most popular comic book still, every place except in the United States. Here they're totally unknown now. But in the rest of the world, especially in Europe, they're the best-selling, they're not just the best-selling comic books, they're the best-selling anything. Nothing sells more than the weekly Donald Duck comics. In Europe, uh, you wouldn't be able to get close to me. I have security guards. It's, I, it's like being a minor rock star in Europe. It's very relaxing in America. Books that are often described as depressing and existentialist, both of which are probably poor descriptions. I don't often get out to mainstream conventions that have more of the superhero type stuff, but this seems to be a pretty good mix of everybody. You know, we've got the Indie Island, which is uh, all the alternative stuff, and then more of the mainstream stuff kind of seeming to congeal together rather well. This year is great because they're doing the whole Indie, Indie, Indie Island area with the independent artists and uh, so that's really cool and that's why I'm, I'm a part of this time because I have my comic book that came out last month, Zigzag. Last year was the first time I actually set up and I was in the uh, back wall <laughs> area for the small press people and uh, so that was really cool to set up at is it's totally surreal like you're sitting on the other side of the table. Just like really the idea of creating something, the imagination that's put into it. Like when you really start speaking with people it's like you start talking about that, it's like you start getting on that level with them, it's like very rewarding, very, very cool. When you create something and like, you know, have them actually like, you know, wish to like purchase it or like, you know, possess it or whatnot, it's like, not only is that really flattering, but like also too, it's just sort of like, you think you really make a like really interesting connection with that person, you know. There you go, thank you very much, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you. I think all kids draw, but I think the kids that stick with it and keep drawing, and then they start drawing heroes and stuff. They just want to draw comics. You know, they want to draw superheroes and, you know, fantasy adventure. And I remember being in high school, looking through a comic book and seeing an ad for the Joe Kubert School. And I had to go there. So I attended the Joe Kubert School for three years and in my senior year scored my first gig at DC. And it's been a roller coaster of working in comics ever since. You know, I've worked Marvel, DC, Image, Acclaim. I've been around the block. I'm doing a book right now for Del Rey that's like all of Star Wars, you know, it's 50 paintings and, and it focuses a lot of the classic stuff, which is, you know, what I'm really into. It's cool because I have kids now that are at that age that they're really into that stuff, so, you know. Yeah, they're just now starting to get it. I think for a while they thought that every dad, you know, did that kind of thing, you know, so. Um, so all the work I've done for like Star Wars and now the Batman Begins uh, movies out and I did a bunch of stuff for that and all that stuff's showing up now and uh, so yeah they're they're into it and it's fun it's and it makes me more excited about it being able to share it with with my kids and then their kids like it and you know so it's cool so if it's a comic you know you spend a lot of time with the script and you you know read it a couple times and you know hopefully you can work with the writer and then you work on the layouts and and. Uh, you know, and then I do like a ton of research, you know, and then um, if it's like a movie like Superman 
returns. I was just in Australia working on that and basically you get there, get a feel for what they're doing, look at the designs, you know, read the script. I had seen Hank Ketchum on television. Uh, he was being interviewed about the movie that was coming out with Walter Matthau as Mr. Wilson. And in the interview, he was asked what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. I was at a low point in my career as an illustrator. I had been a freelancer for 20 some years and computer graphics kind of put my career on the skids. Uh, and I guess I was just looking for an opportunity to come along and this seemed like a good one. So I called Mr. Ketchum out in California and said, uh, Mr. Ketchum, I'm an artist in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you're serious about retiring, I would love to draw Dennis. And after seeing some samples of my work, he agreed to train me to take over drawing the Monday through Saturday panel when he would retire. And he actually retired from the daily drawing in 1994. And I've been doing it ever since. Brian and I like to think that Ex Machina is very much like the world that we live in, but it's just like one DNA strand, you know, away from our version of reality. And what we're trying to do with Machina is um, so show everybody like a different version of those events and how how the world, you know, is changed in either a good or bad way based on like one tiny portion of an event that's different than it actually happened. I did the Green Lantern, I created Wildcat, and with Sheldon Mayer as my editor, I did all the covers for Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, the Justice Society, Flash. So I, I did most of that stuff as a young man. I went on USO trips to Korea, Japan, and Germany, and I met a cartoonist named Gus Edson who created the Gumps. And the Gumps are going downhill, and he asked me would I be interested in working on a strip with him. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not busy, but I didn't say that. I just said, when you're not working, you say you're in advertising. So he sent me a letter showing a picture of Dandy. And I said, Gus, we're going to have the best comic strip in America. The design production sketches that they sent were sort of incomplete. For the first issue, we were actually working off the Cartoon Network version of Grievous, and that's all we had to go on. There's you know, an extra layer of approval that's going on. You're actually dealing with somebody else's franchise, and they can be very protective of it um, in terms of getting back to you about mistakes you've made. Um, the, other, the other aspect of it is that in the, in the case of Lucasfilm, they can actually be sort of secretive about the characters and what the characters look like, right up to the point where they're not telling you everything you conceivably find useful in drawing the character. Um, General Grievous, we didn't find out until comparatively late that he was able to split his arms and do four arms for a sword fight. We were able to squeeze that into the last issue. Oh, that's what. <laughs> And I forgot I'd done this till not too long ago back and I saw it. I'd moved to England and uh, out in the middle of the countryside and I decided that seeing that I'm out here and I'd rather work at home and I want to stay in storytelling. I'd been working in film for a long time and I just love storytelling and I comics was the next next thing to go to. Is it is it plume or plog? Blue. I've heard one person say it's blue, blue as in my arrow plane. That's what I thought. <laughs> During that period of time, I mean, uh, a lot of books were started, and there is an enormous amount of books on the bookshelves. And unless a book is promoted and pushed by a company, uh, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to succeed. And at that time, nobody really promoted books. It was uh, put it out there, fill the bookshelf, don't let the opposition get onto the shelf, and uh, see how it works. But uh, the Ghost Rider, I, 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 it wasn't. Uh, it was too close to the occult, you know. And uh, uh, I don't think people were ready for that, you know. And, I mean, I wasn't even ready for it. And I was the artist. <laughs> you work by yourself in a solitary confinement, and then you come out, and you get to find out what their reactions are. You know, so 
Um, and that's always a thrill for me. So it's the only time I get to touch base with my audience. So I relish it. I'm lucky in that I don't really have to spend that much time alone because I share a studio with, with a couple of guys. So I actually have an office to go to in the morning and, and you know, I can, I can work and bounce things off of other guys and that sort of thing. And um, so it's it, it's helpful to have people around you know like that that I can I can help juice me a little bit creatively. So pretty cool. It was just one of those things I've always uh, always done this you know and I've always wanted to do it. So I just did a, a lot of conventions and met up with other artists. And sooner or later somebody offered me something. And I've been working ever since. The first film I worked on uh, for almost the entire shoot, and then. Uh, for a good six months before they even shot it, you know, writing uh, script outlines and things like that. So I was I was heavily involved with it. So if it failed, you know, it would have been a failure on my part as well. Unfortunately, the I think they just released the fourth one, and they've, they've grown progressively worse as the. Uh, um, as the films have went along, you know, and they're basically they're just retelling the same story over and over. After the first film, uh, the the only way I would agree to participate in another one is if we changed it completely and made it a woman. So I wrote out um, this story called The Bride, where it was a woman who was killed at her wedding, and she comes back to. Um, avenge all the people that killed her, her fiance, and the, and the wedding party. Um, and was told it was implausible, people wouldn't, wouldn't buy it, people wouldn't go for a female hero. Um, you know, for, unfortunately, or fortunately, no, no one told Quentin Tarantino that wouldn't work because Kill Bill made excess of $200 million in the U.S. alone. So. Um, Since I was about 13 years old, I was either going to be a paleontologist or I was going to be um, I was going to be a comic book artist like John Byrne, who was uh, who was my favorite artist uh, as a young man. And um, as you can see, I'm not digging up dinosaur bones right now. I'm drawing a Green Lantern. He was never a bad guy. Um, you know, he was just uh, had a moment's weakness and and that kind of. Uh, shook up his whole destiny but um how was it for me it was it was stupendous it was an amazing opportunity and um i miss it i wish it wasn't over i wish i was still working on it right now that's the best part about heroes con is because i really get to touch base with my fans and um uh i do believe that um i probably have some of the better fans out there because you know i mean they've been loyal with me through thick and thin good times and bad times so um yeah I'm really happy to be here, happy to be at Heroes Con. I play, I play villains and I've been killed playing villains too. And, uh, I've, been this, I've been killed playing heroes too. And, uh, I'm a little movie called The Prey. I was, uh, I had my neck broken by Carl, whatever his name, I can't remember Carl's last name, who played uh, Lurch on the Addams Family movie. Didn't even know it, I was signing pictures and uh, he was sitting next to me and we were signing. And somebody came up and said, weren't you in the prey? And he said, yes. And my wife turned to me and said, well, honey, weren't you in the prey too? I said, yeah. Well, so was Carl. I turned around and said, dang, you're the one that killed me. It's in, in us to know that, uh, that uh, a superhero has to prevail, good over evil. When I was growing up, my, my heroes were Tarzan, uh, the Lone Ranger. Clayton Moore was a very good friend of mine. And uh, uh, Captain Marvel from the comic books. Someone who's a hero is uh, somebody that will do something for no personal recognition, in a sense. You know, when we talk uh, in really jingoistic terms about God bless America and all that kind of stuff, it tends to uh, dissolve the message a little bit, which is there's some guy out there who is really, really scared. You know what's not, what's not a hero? A hero is not somebody that runs into battle with, you know, chewing a cigar with their Tommy gun blazing, blowing everybody away. That's not a hero, that's a lunatic. But a hero is someone who runs into battle and is terrified that they'll never see their wife and children again. And we have those people in our lives, you know. They, they are in, those soldiers are around doing that kind of thing. When we go to movies, we sort of enjoy movies with the theater of people. 
comics are much more solitary. It's just you and the page and what you're reading and the characters' voices in your head. So, so there, there, there's also this sort of um, this aspect of comics that 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 allows your imagination to sort of fill in the blanks. Unseen, unsuspected, dark forces threaten to engulf our world. The only heroes who stand between mankind and oblivion are Meg, Reg, and the Duke. They are the bold adventurers who dare to travel strange passages. The medium itself, uh, you know, I think that there's people who are just naturally drawn to, to pictures. Um, you know, I think it's an art form that's, you know, it's a form of narrative entertainment that, that it doesn't involve a ton of mediation between the, between the creator and the audience. You know, unlike, you know, a film usually, you know, it's, it involves a hu huge amount of people and, you know, the person who conceived it maybe is not the person who directs it, it's not the person who writes it. And the sorts of comics that I think are gaining a lot of popularity these days are comics that are, you know, from the mind of a single creator that, you know, he or she puts together you know, as a single individual, and you know, it's sort of a very personal vision. That they just lift your imagination, they're just awesome. All kinds of, just learn how to read with them, basically, and just drew me in for my whole life. Love them. I think comic books were what video games are now for kids. I think for us who are a little bit older, it's still sort of capturing that past fascination, you know, your childhood, being part of your childhood. Um, it, it's now become more interest in the art, you know, the art of what these guys and gals do, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and the story, the stories are good. I mean, if the stories weren't good, then how come Hollywood this summer is doing nothing but comic book characters? It's obviously good characters and good stories that people seem to be interested in. And it's, it's accessible and for the masses and, and, and affordable. Yeah, it gives you somebody, kind of role models to live up to. But depending on what the writers or the artists do with the characters, I mean, it can, it can pop bubbles for you. I mean, it, it just depends on what type of characters you're following and how true that the writers who are writing the character at the time stay true to what, to what we feel like they are. I mean, it's, some of them really screw them up, but the majority of them, they, they're really good with the characters. Uh, Newsarama is really an extension of just what I find interesting with comics. It's, uh, started with a friend of mine, Mike Duran and I, and, and uh, we just started reporting on stuff that we found interesting. Um, and as kind of as I've gotten older, we've seen the, ta the, the scope of Newsarama broaden and uh, to where it is now, where we cover a lot of different things. And we have a really, really diverse, passionate audience that reads us every day. It's a good thing that you do have Marvel and DC going at this because they're big, they're loud, they've got the, the shiny things, the, the characters that people know about. So you have Marvel and DC doing their absolute best to get people to read their books. And their absolute best is, more times than not, it's a good thing. It's, it's good books. You have uh, all-star Batman and Robin with Frank Miller coming back to Batman. At the same time, you have House of M, which is, you know, the Avengers and the X-Men teamed up into a major story. However, at the same time, you got to wonder, Everybody's looking at Marvel and DC. What effect does this have on smaller press? Does it mean that no one's buying the small press? Or does it mean that, hey, everybody's just excited about comics in general, so everybody's looking at everything more? I see like a lot of guys who are into fine art kind of bringing fine art approaches to comics. Like a lot of guys are doing screen printing and a lot of different techniques than just superhero comics. And both you know, using that for visuals and using that to help inspire their stories. And, you know, anything that's weird and kind of artsy, I like. It doesn't have to be risque. The field is so enlarged now. They have, uh, in those days, they had a code where a woman's dress couldn't go so far or, uh, or their legs always kept close together <laughs> or, or uh, certain things like that. So. They formed a committee to sort of stop that, you see. And it was a oh, long time. It was called a, a key father committee. A senator came down, you see. And uh, so they, but now it's quite liberal. 
they do what they want. In the golden age of comics, and that was it was a very you know hero driven kind of society, and I think it, it was lost you know for I mean decades. So yeah, I would think that there was probably uh, I mean it's it's coming for a full circle just like everything. So yeah, I definitely think that uh, there's a draw for it now mainly because it hasn't been around for so many years. First. Uh discovered Spider-Man, I guess, as a superhero, and I enjoyed it very much, and uh, I think that's what got me going, collecting comic books, was the, uh, the search to finish up, you know, all the Spider-Man comics at the time. I think uh, initially, uh, kids could get into Spider-Man because he was a very young uh, hero at the time, you know, he was in high school, and uh, even though I was only 10 or 12, it was close enough to kind of identify with, like, well, that's cool, I could be Spider-Man. Looking back, uh, you know, I enjoyed the, the super villains and all the fight scenes and stuff, but you get to know the, uh, the alter ego, and uh, I, think, I think maybe I was more interested in the supporting cast and the relationships than uh, even in the, the fights. There's a nice dichotomy there of uh, people admiring him as Spider-Man, but picking on him at high school when he was Peter Parker. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. What's he saying? A sea monster ate my ice cream. <laughs> Ending in a question mark. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing the fans are having similar experiences. comic books and so is his dad so we're together going to the convention. I've been coming here every year since this place opened. I think I've missed one year since that started. To go see the different comics that you can't find at normal stores and I especially like the collectibles that you can't find anywhere else. I spend lots of money, that's fun. Taking her around this show, bring, showing my little daughter the just craziness and she loves it. Elmo. Is that Elmo? You like Elmo? It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of interesting people here, a lot of interesting things, and it's just um, it's a great place to meet people who have the same interests as you do. As being comic book geeks like most of That's us fine. are, it's um, you know we like a wide variety of things as long as it's interesting, put together well, and colorful. <laughs> Toys, T-shirts, memorabilia, um, a lot of everything. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a pretty big comic freak, but I'm more of a toy freak than anything, so that's why I come to check out when I show up. <laughs> I'm into some things that are really hard to find, so um, I can only find them here, so that's cool. But And I love, I, I just love the artists being here, you know, like, I like to come and, like, get sketches and stuff like that and buy their prints, and it's just, you know, really neat original artwork, so I think that's my favorite part of it. It started out with my fascination with comic books. I'm a fan of a particular character, Captain America. But honestly, now that I have two boys, it's become just fun event to be with the boys, to meet the artist. We do this now less as collectors and more as fans. You have all this group of, of um, people who sell comic books and comic book merchandise and all that. So you have that aspect too, and I am a collector, so I'll, I'll spend some time over there spending money, um, finding the things that I've been looking for. Um, it's a time to see artists and writers that you would have never seen anywhere else, to see new stuff. Since they were little, they just come and, and they just would ask the artists to draw something in the book. And um, it's just been a lot of fun. And they've been doing this since they were little. Some of these artists they've seen over and over at the convention. And, and as they get older, the themes change. This is... George Perez. I like the artist. Um, I want to be a writer when I grow up, a comic book writer. It's just fun to know them and, and meet them so you can like get them to sign stuff. And because Dennis is not really a comic book uh, 
superhero anymore. Don't say that. Not to the people who grew up reading him. No. Yeah. Well, it's for people like you that I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Are y'all big Dennis the Menace fans? Dennis the Menace. It's almost like reading also at the same time it was Dandy and everything else from, you know, growing up and learning how to read. Back then they were large enough you could read them. Uh, that's now true. they've shrunk them down so far that people our age have trouble seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> they used to throw the original pen and ink drawings oh away because oh it wasn't considered art back in the 50, 40s and 50s and all that. Even Norman Rockwell stuff, when he did covers, they either painted over them or threw them away because they didn't realize since it was commercial illustration, it wasn't considered fine art, so why keep it? Right. Uh, but they were so mistaken. All comic book art, any art that's any created art. by somebody is worth saving. Well, wonderful. Um, it's wonderful to see the artists that are you know, up and coming and, and new art and hopefuls and giving them a chance. And a lot of the old, you know, dating myself, but a lot of the old storylines that you don't see, you know, you know, like the Dennis the Menace. And we get to go back, kind of relive your childhood. I mean, there's stuff that, that we saw growing up. Now we're, we're getting to actually meet the guys who wrote it who drew it, I mean, it's just, it's like, a, almost kind of like a dream come true. We come down here to just get away from, uh, get away from it all, get away from our jobs, get away from responsibilities, just hang out and have a good time and relive a lot of our past and our childhood, because some of us have never grown up and hopefully we never will. I guess when I was a kid, I, I read comic books all the time. And then when I was in college, for some reason there was a lot of people together that we would just get together and talk about comic books. And I started actually phys really collecting when I was in, in college back in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And my collection from there has kind of grown. But uh, I can't say exactly what it actually ever attracted me to comics to start with. I guess it was just, uh, just the escape. Back then, it was Superman and Batman. That's who I read the most. And I kind of switched over to Marvel. Yeah, I had some old Archie comic books and stuff that I gave them, and they've inherited those. And they keep telling me they're worth money and they're an investment, so we'll see. It's interesting. It's interesting. They're having a great time, so that's why I came. And that's really all that matters, right? That's right. That's right. And they're spending their own money. That makes it even better. <laughs> I'm here to look at comic books and get some stuff. And it's, this is, I think it's going to help me pursue my career and become a comic book artist. I really do. I, I don't, I just draw my own style of superheroes. I've created a lot of different ones. I've created a few, a few um, new ones. I think it's awesome. I think it's great for some people to come, take a day off of work, take the kids and have fun here. It's good. It's cool. It's my sanctuary. <laughs> I draw a lot of fantasy stories. like. I have Greek and Egyptian mythology and a story about a dragon myth and different creatures. So I like that kind of stuff and that's what I like to draw. Just the experience of how to publish it, how to put it together. I guess selling it is really secondary. Um, it's you know more important that he just understands the whole process of being an artist, a designer, a writer, and what goes into that and just finding out about it. I just really want to encourage him with whatever he'd like to do. And I have three kids and they all are writing comics, so I'm sure they're all going to be inspired. So as a family, I guess we probably will be attending conventions like this from now on after this. But that's your story on why. It's a yeah. low print one for the demand and it happened to be the first Wolverine Apocalypse story. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of them weird books that everyone asks for and they just aren't out there to be, to be purchased. I've been coming to Heroes for almost 15 years. I don't know what show he's up to, but I've been to almost every one that Shelton's ever run. Uh, I used to come starting at age 16, as uh, I believe it was around 16, as a fan. And now I've been sitting up as a dealer for about seven years now. So I actually made the crossover. Not only was this the first real comic convention I ever went to as a fan, and I mean, I was one of the people who lined up at the door and ran to the artist they wanted to see when the Friday morning show opened. I was a runner. And it's almost embarrassing to admit it. I'm sure I've gotten drool on George Perez when George Perez used to be one of his regulars here. And uh, the cool thing is now me and George are friends and we chat at shows. And I went from, you know, really bugging the guy to actually, you know, being a friend of his. And he knows me and we talk and we email occasionally. It's really cool. And they just lift your imagination there. Just awesome. All kinds of just learn how to read with them basically and just drew me in for my whole life. Love them.
They have very, there's a lot of different storylines and they're very intricate. They, um, you know, one comic can have 30 different storylines going on at the same time. They, uh, and it's interesting to see how the characters have changed since like the 50s to now, the same characters. I like um, the fact that good usually, almost always triumphs over evil. I had a very hard time reading when I was young and I loved comics. That's actually one reason I started reading so much. If someone has a hard time reading, they'll be able to look at the pictures and know what's going on. The art brings out the story, and the story brings out the art. The art brings out the emotion, and that just transcends all language barriers. You get such a wide variety of people that come to cons. It's, it's all over the spectrum. There's gonna be a lot of people dressed up. Makes me laugh. <laughs> Can you pull my finger real quick? Looking for poison ivy. There you go, keep pulling it. Keep, hold on to it. Catwoman. Oh, that's better, that's much better. Thank you very much. They were here earlier. Long time watchers, first time adventures. That's a little close. I've been coming here since I was like seven years old. Smoke bomb! Turn your face. Ah. <laughs> I've been coming here for about five years. I've come to take over the convention. I've traveled here from the lower of world of Eternia, and this gentleman has a few questions for me. What would you like to know about Lord Skeletor? How long have you been coming to the convention? How long have I? This is my first year. You see, it's a very long ways from Eternia to the planet Earth, and I've been so busy battling He-Man that it's very hard to get over here. This is my first year. I see lots of people here that seem to like the Lord Skeletor a lot, so I'm looking to find some new workers. Merman and Beastman, they, 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 they give me problems. I'm looking for some good workers. I'm obviously Catwoman, of course, and Poison Ivy. It really only took me a collective, like, 10 hours to make it, but it took me, like, three years because it kept stopping. <laughs> yeah. And then I would just set it aside. But then, like, she'd, she'd like, start getting back into it around, like, August or September because she's like, I'm going to finish it. This is going to be my Halloween costume. <laughs> By God, I'm going to go someplace. And she never did. So right. this is really a great, Big you know, motivator. Right <laughs> and I've just been putting mine together slowly across time because you would not believe how hard and long it took me to find an actual, like, Purple leotard. They really don't make them. It's 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 very good. Yes, this is old surprised. school cat. This is old school cat woman. That's right. Not the kind of crash helmet, big goggly thing that she's got going on right now. Are you like selling that? Hmm? Are you like selling? No, it? that's mine. <laughs> yeah, I was asking. Why? Well, no. I don't know that you could pay pay me enough to get that. No. I think if I had, no, there's no way. I mean, with all you probably had to go through to put it together. Yeah, it's it's not a cheap thing. Yeah, all the armor is independent. Um, mm -hmm. The bodysuit is is completely standalone. Mm -hmm. None of it attaches to right. it. Right. But um, each piece is crafted out of ABS, pulled, molded out of ABS plastic, mm -hmm. uh, which is light enough. We I know some guys that have done fiberglass. Mm -hmm. They regret it when it gets hot. Yeah. <laughs> the 501st is actually in episode three. Uh, oh. If you look in the episode three visual dictionary in. Um, where it talks about the Jedi Purge beginning. Mm -hmm. When Anakin goes into the temple to begin the Jedi mm -hmm. Purge, the 501st is the ones that are oh, with him. Oh, that's him? Oh, that, okay. those, uh, so we are canon now uh, okay. in the films. Uh, Master Replicas has also got a clone trooper helmet from that as well. They're thinking about doing a limited run just for the 501st mm -hmm. since uh, Lucas has put us in the film. There's rumors that uh, we may have some part in the live action series that's not been confirmed. Albin Johnson is our founder, and he, uh, one guy with a vision of putting together a small costuming club, and again, now we're worldwide. So, it's been neat. Several of our guys have been invited out to the ranch. Albin has been out to the ranch oh a couple times. Um, and again, we, we got to, a lot of us got to meet Lucas and got to work security for him at Celebration, and so. That is awesome. I'm a big theater geek, so I like to dress up, and Supergirl is one of my favorite characters, so um, 
mostly just love coming here because I get to see everybody that I've met over the years, all the great artists like George Perez and uh, Roy Thomas. I am Destiny of the Endless. It was foretold in my book that I would be here today. I'm currently dressed as the ultimate Captain America uh, from Marvel Comics and a uh, big fan of Heroes Con and big, big fan of the, the, sh the comic shop itself. Well, for one thing, it's escapism, you know, it helps you get away from what's going on in the world. And I think some of the best comic books over the years have, uh, have been heroic comics where you can identify with or, or champion, you know, the, the good guys. Uh, yeah, we need heroes. store with the beautiful fixtures and the Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus. He's got a big Spider-Man fighting Dr. Octopus in his store and I did the designs for that and he's got a, on the bathroom at his store he's got a Clark Kent turning into Superman piece and uh, I did the artwork for that. And uh, I'd already been collecting comics for profit so to speak. I've been buying multiple copies with the anticipation of selling or trading them down the road and uh, it, it was just a natural progression for me to to segue into a store. When I was a kid, I, I read comics. I read like Harvey's and so forth, and Archie's and some Spider-Man, but I never dreamed that there was such a thing as a comic book store. And so uh, when I was, I think, 19, I discovered this place. In 1982, I'd, I'd had the store open for about two years. Started my own small show here uh, at Eastland Mall and, and at some of the hotels around. And uh, so I was aware of what it took or what it was like to, to do a show. The, the first show will always have a special place in my heart because uh, uh, some of my oldest friends were at that first show and they're still still my buddies, you know. Some of them were here in 05. George Perez and Mark Wolfman and Jackson Geis was a, a brand new on the scene artist at the time. He was just a kid. In 84, Stan Lee was here and of course that's a real special thing for me to, to uh, actually have Stan Lee at my convention and get to spend some time with him. Uh, that was real nice. Julie Schwartz was one of our perennial uh, guests after he retired from DC Comics. He was first here in 85 with uh, Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson, so that was cool. But after he retired, he became sort of a regular. And um, the show was always about the time of his birthday. 2000, I think it was? It was his 85th birthday. And it was also the, um, it was an anniversary of the Flash uh, starting the Silver Age of Comics. We had Carmine Infantino that year, and uh, we had uh, a birthday cake on Sunday for Julie. And uh, I mean, it was a big birthday cake that the whole convention could share. You know, it was like 2,500 people or something. You working hard today? Yes. Taking people's yes. blood? Yeah. But I love Sucking it. them dry is a lot of vampire fans I here. know, right? So you must be doing pretty well. They're all like, yes. yep. I usually take blood, but I'll give it to you yeah, today. I'll give it to you today, yeah. I don't know what the bigger head rush is, the loss of blood or meeting all my favorite creators. There's not a con that I do that I look forward to more than Heroes Con. I mean, I've done Dragon, I've done MegaCon, I've done cons in D.C., pretty much the entire Southeast. This is the one that's the most fun. I've been coming here for about seven or eight years now, and uh, it's the only show I commit to every year on the circuit. It's laid back. Everyone's so easygoing. There's not a lot of stress. Not everyone's, like, fighting to talk to an editor to get work. It's just a good time to come and hang out and talk about the craft. Shelton's really created something special with this show. This is the one show we really look forward to every year. You know, San Diego is a working show. It's hard to have a good time. It's, it's, I know it's the big one, but this is the fun one. This is the one that you just can't wait to get to every year. The excitement here is really great. People really love comics here, and you don't feel like you're getting caught up in the whole video game movie blitz uh, extravaganza that some of the other conventions can be. This is a lot more down to earth, and uh, you can actually talk to your friends and, and talk to the fans, and everyone gets to have a great time. Heroes Con is by far my favorite show of the entire con season. This is, I think, believe, my 15th year coming here. I haven't missed it a single time. And um, 
it's it feels like you're coming home. I mean, the, the community is so friendly, and there's a very big difference between East Coast shows and West Coast shows. Uh, and Heroes Con is definitely a lot more laid back, and you get to spend more time talking to the fans one on one. And not to mention our host Shelton Drum is you know very very comic book savvy guy and knows the industry inside and out, and absolutely knows how to treat creators and make them feel comfortable when they come here. Shelton's invited us to you know many a dinner, many a good time. Uh, always been treated like a like a, a a welcome cousin since day one back in 1989. So that's why I keep coming back. It's uh, it's been 16 years. Ooh, that's way too long. Maybe I should stop coming. It's the only one I've been to, you know, 20 years in a row. So <laughs> I first came here actually unbeknownst to show, and I came here, I think, in 1991 or 1992 the first time. Um, back in those days, it was in a different environment completely. It was much smaller. This, this and the Mid-Ohio Con are the two shows where I actually really, really enjoy going there because I get a chance to actually talk to people instead of stand there with lines and lines of people and I, I can't speak to them at all. You know, at this, In this environment, people can actually come up and ask me questions and get an answer. He still treats it like a comics convention. It's not one of these things where, where you sometimes feel that the, the tail is, is wagging the dog and, and the important thing is who's playing Spider-Man in a movie or uh, something rather than Spider-Man himself. When you go to a comic convention, you want to deal with comics and the other stuff should be peripheral and it's great that it's there, toys, TV and everything, but, but uh, you know, to me the criterion is, is it a comic book convention or is it some kind of sort of media convention? In Atlanta last year, there were three dealers selling comic books three dealers out of almost 500 tables and uh, to, to me that was just absolutely ridiculous you know um, it, it, these things are supposed to be based on on the comic culture and they have just seemed to have drifted completely away from it unfortunately due to uh, Wizard World and a lot of show competition right now you know they're very competitive it's hard to get gas and you know run a nice show because there's a lot of other big shows that fans can attend but I think Shelton has gone way out of his way to try to find certain niche guests and try to do things to make sure his show has a nice buzz to it. This year he really went all out on gaming. A lot of gaming people in this town really benefited from it. Had some major tournaments here. Um, the fact that he has, uh, he's had the editor-in-chief of Marvel, I believe, for two or three years in a row now, Joe Casada, is very impressive. Not a lot of shows get Joe, and he goes out of his way to get him. It's nice because it's a regional conference that's easy for all of us in North Carolina to get to, but you get to see people that you wouldn't normally expect to see at a medium-sized convention. Yeah, like people from New York and yes. all over the place. Kurtz and Cassidy and yeah. all those people. Casada. Andy Rutten and James Kachaka. Andy! <laughs> it's my favorite show. It's like convention season hasn't really started till I've, till I've done Heroes because it's such a such a personal and fun con. I haven't come, but I haven't had a good time either as a paying customer or as a guest. You know, it's a task to uh, to get it together every year, but it, it's worth it. Dusty, who works here at the store and does the website and all of our back office work, uh, he's done all the graphics. He, everything that's been written or printed about this show. He did it. Most any guys get kind of ghettoized in the back of a of a hall, or sometimes in a room, you know, where they're just kind of there. And um, so we had thought about there. There are certain guests that we felt like we wanted to have. We want to have as diverse a, a face to the show as possible. And I think it was probably my favorite one yet. Was, although I had the least time of ever for shopping or talking or carousing, but it, it definitely the energy in the room was incredible. Incredible. If you look over there, there's two alcoves where artists are working right now on all kinds of different, uh, um, you know, pieces that are done in, uh, some of them are painted, some of them are done in marker, some of them are done in uh, all kinds of different mediums. But they're, uh, they're all creating new works of art that are going to be auctioned off tonight. You know, it's pretty special that, uh, that Adam and all the rest of those artists do what they do for the show. Uh, I think it's a testimony that that, um, that they enjoy being there. You know, they spend that time, a day, sometimes two days, creating a piece of art that can be auctioned off to benefit the show, and um, it's just wonderful.
Why do, we, why do we take a minimum bid from someone? Somebody's one of the thousand. A thousand. Good, good, good place to start. Two thousand. Two thousand. Anyone? One million dollars. <laughs> Ten thousand has been one million dollars. <laughs> Oh, 4,000. Okay. We're going So we've got it going once for 41. Going twice. So <laughs> and what did you use? It was crayon and? Uh, hair tonic. <laughs> you should have said disappearing me, man. <laughs> Thanks, Sheldon. For you. I didn't have the four grand to buy a uses piece on the Invisible Woman, which would have been nice, but oh well. For a single piece, I think that's definitely a record. Um. What is a writer? Now, I'm, you know what, I, I'll pick you, right? Because you're sitting there and you're like cannon fodder. If I ask you the question, what is a writer, what's your answer? Someone expresses their thoughts on paper. Okay. The answer to the question is... There's no right answer. A writer is whatever, you know, if you are going to be a writer, it's whatever you interpret it to be. My answer was, I feel that a writer is a good observer. You know, when you're standing in line with a, an artist or a writer to get their autograph, you, you have a chance to ask them maybe one, two questions at the most. Um, and that's kind of wasted, you know. Um, you're, you're getting the answer, but everybody else in line can't really hear it. So I think panels are important that, um, uh, you, you get to know these guys a little bit better. What's the biggest difference between when you, back in the 60s and 70s and the storylines and the storylines you see today? What Stan did was introduce a, a level of self-referential humor and what that's evolved into is a, an imposition of a kind of psychological complexity that to a great extent for my money the material can't support. Yeah. Um, it's like this is a guy who runs around dressed in a mask and, and, and long underwear beating the living crap out of people he doesn't know. <laughs> and um, because he knows it's the right thing to do. Um, if, as a kid, I can accept that with all good grace, and I'm perfectly good with that. As an adult, I can draw it. <laughs> I mean, I, I've known Howard Chaikin for years, haven't, but I don't see him much anymore. So we get it together, and suddenly I find, you know, we have things in common, or divergent, that I didn't know before. And I find that interesting, and I'm hoping that if I find it interesting, maybe the, the audience will as well. Craft and comics today, is probably the best it's ever been. Some of the heart is gone. Some of the sense of, a lot of the sense of wonder is gone, but the craft is brilliant. The, the wordsmithing, the art is unbelievable. Um, but they take what we did in 22 pages, and in the 40s was done in eight pages, and they spread it out to four issues. This panel was a perfect example. There were actually really good questions, and I thought this is one of the best panels I've ever been on. When I was literally just breaking into the industry, uh, he invited me to Heroes Con and gave me like this, this, he sort of touted me in his program book as like, you know, this, this, is, the, this is the greatest thing since, since, since sliced bread. And uh, I'll never forget that. He, he really believed in me. He didn't even know who I was. But he just, uh, you know, he believed in my artwork and the stuff I was doing. And, and we've been very, very close friends ever since. It was right around the time that, that my parents had moved to Florida. So my father would always make the commute from, from Florida here to North Carolina to see, to see me at this convention. And my father actually became a mainstay at the convention and, and Shelton would provide him with his own room. And it was, it's just, it was just a really great family experience. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, my father recently passed away so, so he's no longer here. But every time I come to this convention now, I think of my dad. And, um, and since then, you know, he's welcomed my family now. You know, I'm, I'm a dad now. And uh, my daughter's first convention was Heroes Con. The comic book industry, you know, stepped up big right after 9-11 with tributes and, uh, you know, individual stories were told. And a lot of, a lot of people, uh, I think, came into comic book stores after 9-11 because of some of those things. You couldn't go uh, through something like 9-11 and not comment on it. So in, in some ways comics are very serious. Um, a lot of those tributes did was uh, brought into focus who, who the true heroes in the world are, you know, the guys who risk their lives every day that don't have superpowers for the good of the, of the world, you know. 
the, the military, the, the police officers, the firemen. It's because everybody wants to be a hero. And in this day and age with the war going on and stuff, people want true heroes. We all look for heroes in some way, shape, or form, whether they're, they're fictional or real. And I think having paper heroes, as it were, gives you an opportunity to really escape. And I think escapism is the biggest part of comics. That's what got me into it. The Green Goblin says to Spider-Man, you, if you walk out of this door, I've got people with sniper rifles that are going to blow your loved one's head off. So you better kill me. And Spider-Man says on the page, on the very last page, he says, I'll kill you. They said, no way, Spider-Man would never kill anybody. And I said, I agree with you. But the point is this, what makes him a hero is the fact that he has a capacity for anger, but he chooses to override it. He, if he had no capacity for anger, well, I wouldn't be writing Spider-Man, I would be writing Jesus Christ Weekly. Spider-Man, Fantastic Four. Wonder Woman's my favorite. I liked cross-gen comics, but then they went out of business, they went bankrupt, so. I'm kind of searching now for a new comic. I'm a big Teen Titans collector. <laughs> I like Dog Witch. It's kind of an indie, um, indie one. I, he likes more um, DC, Superman, Batman. Oh, I'm a Batman fan from way back. Can't you tell I got the body for it? I mean, I definitely need the mask to cover the face, so you know. It's... When he was a child, he was an underdog. And then he got older and he got a he decided to fight for justice. And I think that's a major appeal too. And he gets to use the cool gadgets too. My favorite is Captain America. That's because he stands for what America is and a lot of what I believe in. I've had compliments over the years already that, that I've helped build a, um, a fan base in, in the Carolinas, you know.